Good morning, everyone. praised and worshiped. Let's pray together. Father God, we just praise you this morning. We come to worship you, Lord. We come to worship you and to honor you. Father, we acknowledge your presence here this morning. So we ask that, uh, that your hand would be upon us as we continue to uh, worship you through song and then as we worship you through the word this morning. Be exalted, great God, in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And what is the Great Commission? Tell the world. Tell the world. And Jesus was born on Christmas, and so we are to go tell it on the mountains, right? So let's sing Tell It on the Mountains. on the mountains, over the hills and everywhere, go. tell it on the mountains that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching, or silent flocks by the night, behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light.
Jesus, we just thank you so very much, Lord, for this beautiful day you've given us, Lord. Thank you for this season. Help us to remember, Lord, this is a, you're the reason for this season. We just send our love up to you, and we thank you, Lord, for sending your son to this earth. I just speak on words what you've done for us, Lord. But thank you. So, Lord, I just pray right now for Pastor Rick that he will give us the message that will fill our hearts with you, Lord, that we can take it with us, apply it to our lives, use it for thy glory in every way. And I give this all to you in your precious name of Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Amen. And before we get into our <clears throat> message for this morning, uh, I was on the phone this past week with the uh, uh, ladies here at the pregnancy center. And uh, they were really appreciative of what our church did for them last year in the Christmas presents that, uh, that we provided for all of the children. And so uh, this year, uh, Brenda has printed out these. We got a list again of the the families there at the pregnancy center and, and the kids that need toys. And so uh, the service today, after the service today, uh, we're asking you to take one or more of the slips and sometime in the next two weeks, 
to purchase a Christmas gift for, uh, for a child. And we, want to, we would like to have those back here no later than the 19th of this month. Uh, because on the 20th, that Monday morning, uh, they're, they're going to be closed that whole week, but someone's going to meet us down there and that Monday morning so that they can get these presents out to the different families before Christmas for, for all the kids. And on the uh, sheets that, uh, that Brenda printed out for us, we have uh, uh, the name of the, of the child, and, and whether it's a boy or girl, and the birth date so you know about what the age is for the individual. And then uh, uh, only the mom's first name is on there uh, for, of course, confidentiality purposes. So, uh, Barbara, if you want to make sure that, get, get one of those from Barbara at the end of the service today. Make sure that uh, you take one or two or more if you would like. And uh, uh, just make sure that we get those back no later than the 19th of this month. That gives you two weeks uh, in which to do that. Uh, the other thing that we'll be doing is <clears throat> that we'll also be sending a gift card for the family itself, for the parents, uh, from uh, Food for Less, so that they can uh, have a really nice, hopefully a nice uh, Christmas meal uh, and, and helping them out. So uh, thank you for your support and help last year, and we look forward to, to having a, uh, a great year this year. They, they mentioned to me this is for the size of our church, uh, we've got a tremendously big heart and that we do more percentage-wise than any other church, I think, in the Valley as far as our support for them is concerned. So let's continue doing that. That's God's people moving. In fact, one of the statements that, uh, that one of the ladies met was that uh, says, your church is certainly the example of a true New Testament church. And so we're, we're uh, I'm thankful to each one of you for, for your support. Looking at our, uh, continuing our, our study uh, through the book of James, and <clears throat> of course you know, holidays come and holidays go, um, the Word of God continues on, and uh, I try to stay uh, uh, in step with, with where we're at as far as our teachers are concerned, no matter what the holiday is, uh, I try to, to continue just, just teaching through the Word. So this morning... Uh, we're going to be looking at James, James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. We're going to be talking about managing your money wisely. Managing your money wisely. Uh, and James chapter 5, 1 through 6. Uh, the late William McDonald, who was the uh, past president of Emmaus Bible College, uh, wrote a commentary which became the actual textbook uh, for uh, the study of James in the college uh, on the epistle of James. And, and this, is what he, this is what he wrote concerning this particular section, chapters 1 through 6 of, of James. He said, quote, In one of the most searching and piercing sections of his letter, James now launches into a condemnation of the sins of the rich. The words fall like hammer blows, blunt and unsparing. In fact, the denunciation is so strong that these verses are seldom preached on. James is here seen in the role of a prophet of social justice. He cries out against the failure of the rich to use their money to relieve human need. He condemns those who have become rich by exploiting their workers he rebukes their use of wealth for self-indulgence and luxurious living. Finally, he pictures the rich as arrogant oppressors of the righteous, unquote. And he is so true. Very few preachers really tackle this particular section of the epistle of James uh, because it's a hard one to, to teach on. It's uh, certainly a hard one to uh, uh, to prepare for. But as we look at this section of James's letter, let's learn, let's learn how to manage our money wisely. And we, we can do that by learning from the mistakes of the readers to whom James addresses his comments. Uh, James now has dealt with the issue of, of the tongue, uh, 
the issues of improving our relationships. Uh, we've talked about how to handle conflicts and also about rejecting subtle sins. So James now comes and, and, and gets into the issue of money and wealth. Some folks think that the, the Bible teaches that only selfish, greedy people become rich. They, they get rich because of their greed. They get rich because of, of their selfishness. And that's simply not true. You know, if, if, as you read through the Word of God, what you're going to find is that there are a great many of godly saints, godly saints that were exceptionally re, uh, rich. I mean, by today's standards, think of Abraham. Abraham was a millionaire by today's standards. David and Solomon were two of the wealthiest men in their day. And then consider Job. Good old Job said he was, he was probably the richest person in the world. And uh, he could probably be considered the, the uh, Jeff Bezos or the Elon Musk of our day uh, in his time. Also, a lot of people think that the Bible teaches that money is the root of evil. You've heard that. You know, well, money's the root of all evil. Well, that's not true either. Because Paul actually wrote... In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, 1 Timothy 6, 10, Paul said this, For the love of money, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that it is a sin to be rich. But it does teach that it is wrong for a person just to hoard all their riches. God's not against a person being wealthy. But God wants us to use our money wisely, regardless of how much or how little of it we have. I found out through my travels uh, around the world that uh, compared to many of the people in the rest of the world, Americans are very wealthy people. We are very wealthy people. I remember my first trip to India. Boy, was it a culture shock for me. As we landed in, in uh, Bombay, which is now called Mumbai, and I, I looked out the window of the plane as we were landing, and I saw this, this, this huge... Uh, chain link fence and then just just on the other side of the fence was all these little shacks and and uh, and tents along the side of the fence then the next day uh, we we stayed in the motel that night right there uh, off the the, by the airport, and we got out, we went for a walk, and we walked down, and we came to where those places were. And I was devastated to see the poverty that existed in that country. Here were families living in a, 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 a just, it looked like just tarps, just these tarps that you buy in the stores, and, and, and it just tarps hanging over the fence, hanging over the fence, and there in the family of five or six people living there. And then to look and see where they were washing their clothes and getting water to take a bath and getting water to cook their meals from this big well that was dug in the ground. And to look down and see the garbage that was floating in that. As we were walking down the street, I looked over and I saw just a, a, a it looked like a little ditch alongside the road. And I was cautioned, don't go near it. That's their sewage drainage. You know, according to a recent survey, the salary in India in 2021 was about $392 a month. That's about $2.25 per hour. 
In America, if you make over $3 an hour and own and own an automobile, you are very wealthy compared to the average worker in India. I remember oh, on, on our first trip there, we went down to southern India. It was in a place called, uh, it was Kerala, India, a little town called Traven, Trevendrum or Treven, Trevendium. Yeah, those Indian names are, you know. Uh, anyway, we, we stayed in a hotel there, and they had their own restaurant in the hotel. And I remember there were three, uh, two, two other uh, men and myself. And we ate in that restaurant the first night. And, and uh, I, I looked at the menu, and I looked at the prices, and I says, man, there's got to be a mistake here. Because in the United States of America, you go into a fancy restaurant, you order chicken cordon bleu, and you're going to pay $15, $20 for it. On their menu, chicken cordon bleu, $2.49. I said, man, I've got to have me about a dozen of those. <laughs> but each one of us ordered that. And, 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 uh, and then, of course, one of the guys there, he was a nice, well-built, Rosie Greer type person. He says, I want some French fries. So he, so he ordered... French fries, you know, 98 cent for a plate that was enough for, a, yeah, about a pound of French fries. And then we ordered a nice uh, uh, drink, some mango lassies. And then for dessert, they ordered, uh, the, the, the waiter came up to us and said, I got a special dessert for you guys. I said, what's that? So he took a fresh pineapple and sliced it and took a slice of fresh pineapple and laid it on the plate, and then he put ice cream on top of that. Oh, was that good. Oh, no wonder I came back about 40 pounds more than when I left and had to pay overweight for the plane. <laughs> when we got through with our meal, I got the bill, and I paid it, and, and, and gave him a, the standing rate at that time for tips was about 10% of the bill. That was back then, and I paid him 10% of the bill. You know, I found that interesting thing, though, because each evening we would go out, we would speak, and we'd come back. And by the time we came back in, the restaurant normally would be closed. But the next night we came in, and there's the manager of the restaurant waiting at the door, saying, come on. <laughs> Invited us in. We sit down, and he had a meal for us. And then we asked for that special dessert. <laughs> and the waiter says, Oh, so sorry, sir. We're all out of fresh pineapple. I says, what? I got to have that. You got me hooked on it now. And so the manager called the waiter over, and he, they sit there and talk back and forth. The next thing I saw, the manager reach on and slap that waiter on the back of the head. You ever watch NCIS? Yeah. Yeah. You ever see that? Pow! Well, he gave him one of those, those uh, uh, Gibbs slaps. And next thing I know, the waiter's running out the door. So I thought, what did he do, get, get fired because he told us there was no more pineapple? About 10 minutes later, the waiter comes back in with a fresh pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was so good. I found out later, every night now that we went back, they kept the restaurant open just for us three Americans to come in and have our meal and have our pineapple and ice cream. And I found out later that uh, no wonder they treated us like royalty at the time. That tip that I gave him was equal to one month's salary for that waiter. So you can imagine getting a month's salary every day as long as we're sure they're going to keep that place open. <laughs> that's, that, that's how... Americans are looked upon in some places overseas. We're very wealthy. And uh, I think they have a misconception because uh, there, there's a lot of folks here that are not wealthy. Certainly, we're not wealthy. And uh, when, you're, when you're living from sometimes from payday to payday, but when you go over there, they think you're a very rich American. You can afford anything. No matter how much money you have, though, here's the thing. God wants you to handle it 
with biblical wisdom. God wants you to handle your finances <clears throat> with biblical wisdom. So James, in uh, James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, reveals four things that we need to do in order to manage our money wisely. <clears throat> the first thing is this, looking at verses 1 through 3. We must not be greedy or selfish. We must not be greedy or selfish. In James, in a verse, in verse one, James chapter five, verse one, he writes, "Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you." Now, understand something here. James is not indiscriminately condemning wealth. <clears throat> What he is doing is condemning wealthy people who have accumulated their wealth by exploiting others. The wealthy people are not, not currently in misery there because the, what are they doing? They're enjoying all their riches with lavish living. But just as it did for the rich man in the parable that Jesus taught over in chapter 16 of the book of Luke. Uh, misery is on its way. Misery will catch up with them. Jesus said about the rich man in, in Luke chapter 16, verse 23, he says, and, and being in torments and Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. He was in torment. The misery came to him. He enjoyed all that luxury during his lifetime, but he had to pay the price. Now in verse 2, James writes, your riches are corrupted. In Bible times, people's wealth or their riches was generally in the forms of grain or oil or or other types of produce, in clothing, or gold and silver. And, and James addresses that here. So when he says your riches are corrupted, probably he was referring to the grain that they had that had become wormy or rotten while it was in storage. In other words, rather than, than using it to feed the people around them that were starving, they just kept it in storage until it became rotten. It had been hoarded to the point of becoming worthless. James also says in verse 2, your garments are moth-eaten. That phrase is, probably was referring to rich people having hoarding their, 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 even their clothing, letting it become so moth-rotten rather than giving it uh, their, their excess, their unused garments to the poor. Sometimes we have clothes hanging in our closets that we seldom or if ever use or wear, and it just hangs there and hangs there. And there's people out in the world today who are needy, who need the clothes <clears throat> that we can provide for them, but we just hoard it. We just keep it hanging in our closets. Their closets back then were probably so full of garments that they didn't frequently use, probably subject to be coming moth-eaten. James is pointing out how morally wrong it is to hang on to clothes like that when there is so, so many people in the world today that are in desperate need. Isn't it true that sometimes we, uh, we also hoard unused stuff until it's ruined or it's thrown out? Or even when we don't need the money, we'll go out and sell it at a yard sale or garage sale or something 
rather than giving it to families in need or to some charitable organization that can take care of those families. So James continues in verse 3. He says, your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last days. What James is doing here is suggesting that large amounts of money went unused for long periods of time because it was not needed by the owner. They were hoarding or stockpiling their money out of pure selfishness, even in the face of those who had great need around them. Instead of putting their finances to work, to feed the hungry, to clothe the poor, to provide medical aid for the sick, or support missions work to spread the kingdom gospel message around and, and uh, to increase God's kingdom, the rich were saving their money for that rainy day occasion. It was of no benefit to anyone. You know, I'm so thankful for our church here that when we've been able to help a lot of folks who have had needs, financial needs, uh, food needs, clothing needs, uh, some folks who have not been able to afford to pay their medical bills because their insurance companies wouldn't cover it, we were able to step in and and, and pay those bills for them. And, and, and as I've said when I first came to this church, folks, if, if we will do it God's way, God will bless that and honor that. And it seems like the more we give, the more God blesses and the more God gives back. So that we get to the point where, where our finances will come up to a certain point and, 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 and it's like, hey, you know, we need to step out and help someone and we'll do that. God blesses that, and he honors that. He continues in verse 3. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last day. The Bible te clearly teaches us in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6, that, uh, uh, and, and this is something that we need to understand. In, in this passage of Scripture, James is not implying that we should not save our money or not invest our money, because the Bible is clear about that in Proverbs 6, verse 6, that we should observe the ant and consider her ways to be wise. So what, what ways of the ant should we consider? I think Solomon covered that in uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 6, verse 8. Solomon writes that the ant provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. Joseph was good at that. He knew that a famine was coming, and he prepared for the famine by... by uh, by saving up for that period of time that he would need it. And that's, that's okay. We need to do that. But we don't do it to the point where we have excess that is just sitting there going to waste. We should save. We should invest in the future. But we must not be selfish and hoard all our money when there is so much need around us. In our culture today, <clears throat> hoarding is not so much of a problem as it is to some people as it is with a, a need for that instant gratification through personal debt. As a result, even most Christians are in deep debt and unable to help others who are in need. I heard, I hear this sometimes from folks. 
I can't afford to tithe. I can't afford to tithe. I've got to give, I've, I've got to pay my bills. Well, how come you have so many bills that you can't afford to give God what is due him? He should get the first fruits. And, and I've seen this happen many times when people have been in that situation. I said, step out in faith. Give to the Lord first. That's what he asks. Show him that you're worshiping, you're honoring him. And when they do, you know, it's a matter of time that, that I've been able to sit down with people and help them establish a budget and work through that and everything. It's a matter of time that they come to me and says, I've got some extra money I'd like to give. I'd like to help someone out. One of the major contributing factors of divorce in America is personal debt. Personal debt. Purchasing uh, depreciating items on credit, items that we really don't need, that's just another way of, of showing how selfish and greedy we are. I, I want to I kind of <clears throat> get myself in trouble this morning. We were in the Christmas. I get myself in trouble a lot. Isn't that right, Barbara? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> we're at the Christmas season right now. And I, I'm not a bah humbug person. I think it, we... we I, you can ask anyone. I'm willing to give. But here's the thing. It's the Lord's birthday. It's not my birthday. You get what I'm saying? Why, why is it, and Helen's heard me say this, and I think I can, I, can tense, I can feel a tense now. Why is it that every year many people go out and spend money they don't have to buy things to give the people that don't need it. When we could take that money and use it for the Lord's work. Give it to the families that we're going to be helping out Christmas this year. Helping those who, who are going to be sitting in their homes with no heat. No food. It's just a personal thing with me. I, I just think we ought to give it to the Lord. And we give it to the Lord by giving it to the people he wants us to help. Statistics have shown that the majority of adult Americans have less than $1,000 in their savings account. The average debt among households in America on credit cards alone is over $7,000. And what's really sad is that Christians are no different than non-Christians when it comes to saving and comes to debt. And that's why I think we all need to consider the, the principle that's found in Galatians chapter 21, verse 20, or not Galatians, I'm sorry, Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 20. I want to read that from the God's Word translation because it kind of brings that meaning out a lot better. It says, costly treasure and wealth are in the home of a wise person, but a fool devours it. If, if we're foolish enough to devour or to spend all we make, what does it make? What does that make us if we spend more than we make by going into debt? Why is it that we spend more than we make to save so little? I'll tell you why. It's because we try to live for today. And we don't apply biblical, godly principles in our money management. In talking about our wealth and, and possessions, James says that the corrosion of your wealth will be a witness against you. That means that God knows our checkbooks and God knows our buying habits 
And we'll be judged on the basis of those things also. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, the first part of uh, verse uh, uh, 20, Jesus warns us not to, and he says this, Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Instead of storing up earthly treasures and possessions by, uh, by spending all we're, we make or, or even more than we make on ourselves, we should, as one writer says, send it on ahead. By managing our finances wisely according to biblical principles, because, folks, we can't take it with us. You can't take it with you at all. You've heard me say this before. Billy Graham just hit the nail on the head when he said this. He says, in all my years of doing funerals, I've never seen a hearse tow towing a U-Haul trailer going to the cemetery. We can't take it with us when we leave this world. The first step to take in not hoarding our money or spending it foolishly on ourselves to obey God's word by giving it back to God through your local church. <clears throat> That's the best way to store up treasures for yourselves in heaven because, because then it's going to be used to, to spread the kingdom gospel message and bring people to Christ and help Believers to grow in their faith and become more like Jesus. And to reach out and be that extending arm of the Lord to help those who are in need. To help the widows, to help the orphans. The first step in managing your money wisely is to refrain from from being greedy or selfish. The second step is this. We must not be dishonest. We must not be dishonest. Verse 4 really points that out. The Bible, the, the, the Bible not only condemns the hoarding of wealth, as we just learned, but it also condemns getting rich by being dishonest. And there's many ways to be dishonest. In Jesus' time, people would, would work for the rich and, and they were to be paid a day's wage at the end of the day. They didn't get a weekly check, they got a daily check, really. Many of the people were so poor that if they did not receive their pay at the end of their day, their entire family would go hungry. And unlike in our day, there were no contracts. There was no minimum wage that they had to be paid. They, there were no labor laws which would protect the workers. So James writes in verse 4, he says, Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. The Bible says in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 14, You shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, whether one of your brethren or one of the aliens who is in your land within your gates. You know what God's Word teaches us? God's Word teaches that employers must pay their workers fair wages and pay them on time. And James goes on to say in verse 4 that the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. The wealth that the rich made by exploiting their workers cries out to the Lord, just like the blood of Abel did in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 4, uh, chapter four verses 8 through 10, we read of, of the story of Cain who... Uh, rose up and killed his brother. Then the Lord asked Cain where, it, where, where his brother was. Cain, where's your brother? And so what was his reply? Oh, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? 
Then the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. The workers in James's day had no wage and labor board to turn to. They weren't members of some union that represented them. <clears throat> they had no recourse but to cry out to God. And that phrase, the Lord of Sabaoth, means the Lord of hosts, the, the Lord of the armies. And what it emphasizes is the majesty, the power of God as a supreme ruler who would hear the cries of the workers and would intercede on their behalf. In Psalm chapter 14, verse 6, David said that the Lord was the <clears throat> refuge of the poor. <clears throat> And in Psalm 140, verse 12, David wrote, I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. James is giving a very serious warning to any person or any business that misuses or, or treats people unfairly. Every Christian business person in the workforce has a responsibility, an obligation, if you will, under God to make sure that everyone under their supervision and authority is treated fairly and impartially and paid a fair wage. All of us must be careful that all the wealth or possessions we acquire are done so honestly, morally, and ethically, and not by taking unfair advantage of others. Managing our money wisely. We must not be greedy or selfish. We must not be dishonest. And thirdly, we must not be self-indulgent. In verse 5, James is denouncing the luxurious living of the wealthy. How, how can one squander their wealth on expensive jewelry, custom-made designer clothing, gourmet eating, luxury cars and homes while ignoring so many people in the world who are living in poverty and in desperate need? You know, in, in relationship to most of the world, the average American enjoys great wealth, but most of the money that we make is spent on ourselves. I don't think that the problem in our country is hoarding our money as much as it is in wastefully spending our money on ourselves. James writes in the first part of verse 5, you have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. Now, the words that, that James wrote here in this letter was originally written to wealthy landowners, landowners who were exploiting the poor. But I, I think it could easily be applied uh, to us today. James is not implying here that we should not live comfortably or that we should not enjoy the fruits of our labor. Solomon wrote this in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 18. In Ecclesiastes 5, <clears throat> 18, Solomon said, Here's what I've seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life, which God gives him, for it is his heritage. Listen, God wants you to, to, to buy things you enjoy. He wants you to, to uh, uh, enjoy what he provides for you. I know several Christians who are very 
wealthy Christians. They live in big, expensive homes. They drive fancy cars. They wear really nice clothing. However, I do know this about them. They didn't purchase those things with money that they should have given back to the Lord. They didn't purchase those things with money that they should have used to pay bills or, or money that they owed to someone else. What James is talking about here is living a life of luxury at the expense of others with money that was gained by dishonest means. Being self-indulgent, I think, reveals that we waste resources and are not good stewards of what God has really blessed us with. We're not managing our money wisely. Folks who live in pleasure and unrestrained luxury are like those who, James says in verse 5, it says, they have fattened their hearts as in the day of slaughter. He's being a little sarcastic there in comparing those who, who are selfish, those who are self-indulgent, dishonest people, who are only concerned with the present to animals who are getting fat for the slaughter. I like what William McDonald, how he describes them. He says, quote, like animals fattening themselves just before their execution, or like soldiers who spend their time looting while others are perishing around them. I think when we're tempted to behave like that, we should read and heed what Jesus said in Mark 8, 36. He says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What did it profit the rich man in the parable that Jesus talked about who just acquired all that wealth, but he lost his soul. Let's learn to manage our money wisely by not being greedy and selfish, by not being dishonest, and certainly by not being self-indulgent. And then the last one, number four. We must not be manipulative. We must not be manipulative. Let me spell that for some of you. M-A-N-I-P-U-L-A-T-I-V-E. Did I get that right, Helen? I think so. My, Looks right. my, spell, <laughs> my spell checker there. Every time, you know, I, I'm so, I, I try to be faithful. And Hunt, spell check this before I mail it out, okay? She spell checks it, makes all the corrections. We send it out. It's good. So one time I look over it and I double look over it. So one more, see, Helen's not home. So I got to get this thing out. And so I look over it, and I look over it, and I look it over a third time. It looks good. <laughs> Send it out. Helen comes home and says, I see you didn't spell check that. <laughs> I think it was last week I sent out some prayer requests. It says, or, or the, the notes, the notes. It says, here, here are the notes. And I wrote, here ate the notes, <laughs> A-T-E. <laughs> Now, many of you are going to run back and get your emails out and look and check that out. And you're going to find out, yeah, your pastor makes mistakes like that. Manipulative. The final charge that James makes against the rich is in verse 6. He says this, You have condemned, you have murdered the just, he does not resist you. <clears throat> the wealthy had used their money at the expense of others in order to gain influence and position. How many people around the world today do you know that do that? They want to gain influence and position. So they're spending hundreds, thousands of dollars on advertising and buying nice gifts for different people and throwing big parties and everything just so they can, and, and they do it at the expense of others so they can gain that influence and position. The, the, the rich 
In James' days, the rich were selfish and they were greedy and they used their money to influence the courts to punish innocent men who could not afford to defend themselves because they didn't have the money or the power to do so. Rich people had condemned innocent men by false accusations, by intimidations, and cruel language. Today, I think we commit similar practices when we allow unfair business practices to take advantage of those who may not be able to defend themselves or who may not have a recourse. Consider the companies, and you've probably read about it in the papers, companies who, who a person is close to retirement and they fire them. Or companies who pay women less than men for doing the same job. Or maybe promoting men over women or over other men who are more qualified because they belong to the good old boys club. We're told in Psalm chapter 82, verses 3 and 4. In Psalm 82, 3 and 4, it says, Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. We live in a money-mad world. And in our money-mad world today, the poor, the elderly, the uneducated are taken advantage of. One of the saddest things that, that I've noticed in our world today is the number of scams that are directed towards the elderly or uneducated folks. I'm sure you've heard about the social security scam, the IRS scam or some of the bank scams and, and maybe the lottery or, or inheritance scams or, you know, I've just got to get rid of this money and, 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 and I want to help you make thousands of dollars. I, I received an interesting phone call the other day. It was comical to me. I almost, in fact, I, I think I probably did laugh right in the guy's ear. I answered the phone. When my cell phone rings, folks, it, it's a different thing. If it's a home phone, we, we look up and it, we don't recognize the number. We don't answer the phone. Because 99% of the time, it's some telemarketer or scammer. But on my cell phone, since I pastor a church, I... If it rings, I've got, I answer it unless I definitely know it's a, you know, if, if they call some number, like I have Magic Jack when I travel overseas. Boy, if I get a phone call through my Magic Jack, I know that's one of those goofballs out there trying to take my money. But anyway, the other day I received this interesting phone call. And... told me, I, you, we're calling to verify a charge on your credit card in the amount of $700 that was placed through Amazon. <laughs> yeah, anybody get that? Amazon? Yeah, look at that. My goodness. I'm not the only one. See, all I needed to do was press this one button on my phone and someone would help me take care of that. I did press the one button. It's called a hang-up button. <laughs> another, another call I got was really, this is one I really laughed at. How? Hell, Hello, Grandpa? Grandpa, this is your grandson. I said, my grandson? Which grandson is this? This is your old grandson. I'm in some trouble. I says, well, what, what, which, which grandson? What's your name? What's your grandson, Grandpa? You know what's so interesting about it? I was listening, and he obviously was in a room with a lot of other people. Lots of yeah. and, and I heard this other guy saying, 
Hey, Grandpa, this is your grandson. I got problems. I mean, I just laughed and hung up. But you know what? There's scammers out there doing, and and they're 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 aiming at the elderly and the uneducated. And you'd be surprised at how many people have fallen and lost their entire savings over that. My mom's 94 years old, lives on her own. Next year, she'll be living out here with us. She, she says she can't wait, and she looks so much forward to coming here and meeting you guys. And she's going to tell you about her Jesus. Because if, if you're in her vicinity, within five minutes, she's going to tell you about Jesus. But, but she knows, I don't answer those calls. And sometimes if I do, because it looks like it might be a phone number that is familiar, as soon as they start to spill, I hang up. We need, we need to teach more of our elderly to do the same thing. Be very careful, very careful. As Christians, we should never, ever take advantage of the less fortunate. In fact, we should do everything we can to prevent others from doing so as well. Let us always remember the words of Solomon. Solomon who who wrote in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 8. Better is a little righteousness than vast revenues without justice. Managing your money wisely. In order to do that, you must not be greedy or unselfish. You must not be dishonest. You must not be self-indulgent, and you must not be manipulative. So here's your question. What have you learned today from James' letter? In what ways can you better manage your money in order to be biblically wise? Will you commit today to be the best steward you can with the resources that God has given you and to wisely manage your money by learning and applying biblical principles of money management in your life? Let's pray. Father, thank you for, for the boldness of James in writing this letter. The words that you have given him, that you have anointed, that through the inspiration of your Holy Spirit he has penned. And it's a good teaching for us today. God, may we search our hearts now and purpose in our hearts, Lord, to manage our money wisely, to learn those godly principles of how to handle the resources and, and, and the blessings, not only the financial blessings, but, but the gifts and the talents that you have given each one of us to use those wisely in a way, Father, that, that will uh, promote your kingdom, that will bring honor and glory to you and be a great witness in this world. Help us, Lord, to truly walk in your ways and to, money, to manage our money wisely in our world today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Now let's stand together. I remember this. <laughs> Great.